I want a Hilton on the moon. That's where we're headed. Maybe that's why you can't sleep. Too much coffee. Now that I can finally understand you, I am less impressed with what you have to say. Are you thinking about getting out of cigarettes and into the movies? I'd appreciate it if you'd forget all that nonsense I was saying before. And you made an executive decision to do nothing. I didn't do anything but turn him down. I'm going to speak very honestly with you. I don't think folks do that often. Probably scared. Or they trust my work. Welcome to Mad Men Men, the weekly show where we discuss a show that used to come out weekly. Each week, we take a close look at an episode of the AMC series Mad Men, which ran from 2007 to 2015. And we're changing the conversation of the show all these years later, where one of us is a first time watcher of Mad Men. One of us went through it one time back when it was airing. And then there's me, who watches it in my sleep. I'm John Agroni, and I podcast what I want when I want it. And uh, with us, uh, hmm, I'm going to speak very honestly with you, Will Ashton. Hmm. I don't think folks do that often. Probably scared. <laughs> or they trust your podcast. How's it going, Will? I'm all right. You know, I'm a little sad because of this app, but uh, we'll work through it. I think maybe you're sad because Mike Overholse, that's a $25 million podcast you stuck your nose in. John, I'm starting to feel like your intro is just you kind of bragging. I don't know if that's an angle we've brought up. It's like, <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess he's watched it once. Oh, Mike watched it a little. And I watched it all the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm addicted to it and pathetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I, that's that's how it I, it comes across, at least to me in my head. Uh, hey, hey, Mike, how do you how do you say podcast in Portland? Mad Men Men. It's already a foreign word. <laughs> Uh, this week we're talking about We Small Hours. Uh, this is ep- uh, episode nine of season three. And uh, last episode we talked about Souvenir. And this one's directed by Scott Hornbacher. Uh, now, you probably both have noticed that name in the opening credits a lot. This is his first time directing, but Scott Hornbacher, excuse me, is a uh, uh, one of the executive producers of Mad Men. And so this is his first time directing. But uh, I was listening to the commentary and Weiner pointed out that Hornbacher has been like a constant creative contributor to the show. So uh, they were pretty happy to have him actually directing here. Uh, Writer wise, we have Dobby Waller back uh, along with Matthew Weiner. As usual, uh, Waller did uh, My Old Kentucky Home earlier in the season. So uh, we are now getting into the second half or the last uh, few episodes of season three. So uh, after this, we just have four episodes to go before we get to season four. And this is a tough episode. I I messaged Mike and Will, but especially Will, kind of a bit hauntingly uh, because this is uh, as soon as the episode started, I was like, oh, no, I know this episode. Mm -hmm. Will's going to have a hard time because Will's favorite character, I think is Sal? Yes, Sal is my favorite character. See, when you were saying that, I thought you were going to be like, just a heads up, Sally just straight up commits murder this time around. <laughs> Maybe she already has. <laughs> yeah, yeah for that pencil true. box. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, because they mentioned the pencil box. I'm like, oh, God, what? she going to like stab a kid's eye out or something? What's going to happen with her? And you were, you were close to the fact that it did involve someone named Sal. Uh, Sal is even called Sally in this episode at one point. And I was like, oh, man, Will must be on, on uh, pins and needles. When you, when you saw Sal in the commercial with Lee Gardner Jr., did, did any death flags start coming up there? Uh, for me, I mean, you mean the fact that it's like him looking over the horizon, you know, that sort of thing? Is that what Just you're it, like my foreboding warning have to do with Sal? I mean, I didn't really think it was about Sal because I thought he was always safe because he's that, uh, you know, the rascal with the puns and like who who wouldn't want to have him around? Uh, well, you know, Will, Mike and I, we had a little bit of a sidebar, a little conference yesterday deciding what to do about this episode because, you know, we were trying to decide, should we tell you whether or not Brian Batts, who plays Sal, comes back? You know, he gets fired in this episode. Not clear, right? If he's going to still be in the show. And, and Mike and I were like, do we tell Will, you know, either way, right? And so we both decided we can't do it. Like, we're, sure. we're not, Mike, like, we're not good enough, right? Like, we don't, I mean, we don't have the skills. Not at all. No. To, Normally, to transmit this res- message. normally I don't look at like the IMDb cast list to like see how many like what number of episodes the actors uh you know stay in or out of the show. This time I made an exception for Sal. I was like, there's no way this is the very well, last episode well, of Sal. You're before, kinda before, getting you're getting ahead of yourself. Yeah, yeah. Will. Before before you go on, Will, we have a special guest here for you. Um we have Father a it's special. We flew him in. Oh, we wow, flew okay. him in. Uh, we were like, look, there's only one person who can explain this situation to Will. It's not going to be IMDb. <laughs> you know, IMDb has all kinds of bugs and, you know, people get in there, they tinker where they shouldn't. I have. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, right to this day, Michael Overholz is the director of The Fugitive, unfortunately, on IMDb. And oh, that's wow. not okay. true. No, congratulations. <laughs> Known for. Um, but no, uh, let's bring him in now, Mike. Uh, so this is uh, Brian Bat. Brian, welcome to, to, to Mad Men, men. Uh, you're definitely real and not one of us doing an impression. Um, hello. How's it going, Will? Oh, wow. It's a big honor to you know, finally meet you. I, I'm so sorry, but I don't have a lot of time. Oh, okay. But I just... I wanted to tell you, this is my last episode on the show. That's a shame. Also, that's hey, Chauncey. Chauncey! <laughs> Chauncey's here too, what the heck? We're doing a spinoff. <laughs> I was we wondering, that was, like, that was the joke I was going to say for the end, is that, you know, Sal and Chauncey will, will finally, as the rejects of, mm. uh, you know, of the company... We'll finally get a chance to team up and start their own advertising firm. I'm glad you're a fan, but I do have to go now. And we'll put on a great show for you, okay? I appreciate that. It's nice to talk to you, Brian. Well, well I, I do want to let you know I did reach out to the real Brian Bats <laughs> <You really did. laughs> to, to see if he would <laughs> to let you know. This, this was plan B. This was plan oh, okay. B, B for Brian. Yeah. Did you act, so you actually reached out to Brian Bat to see if he would come on last minute to the show? Not come on. I I I I um I I essentially asked him for an unofficial cameo. Yeah. Oh, okay. I see. Just so to break the on? news to you. Yeah. Is we he would on? have paid him. We genuinely no. would have paid okay. him. Okay. Yeah. He's not the, on cameo though. The the highest profile cameo person you can get from Mad Men is a uh, um, Francine. Which we are, I mean, mm. I feel like that's in the works. That's it's only $50. And, and let me let me tell you, Will, um, Mike put so much work and effort into this. Uh, I think he genuinely cares about you. I know you've been sending letters to him back and mm. forth. Does well, anyone I, read this? I appreciate the effort. I mean, it would have been Not amazing that. if you had brought, because there was a brief moment where I was like, are they really going to bring on Brian <laughs> Bad? <laughs> <laughs> he just like pops up into the video call. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we did. Uh, didn't you hear him? I know. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if he did show up and Will couldn't get his camera to work? <laughs> I know. It'd be such a bummer. Right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, we small hours. Okay, let's actually talk about the episode. I mean, Will, besides, um, you know, not besides, but like including the whole stuff with Sal and, and how all that goes down. Sure. Uh, yeah, how'd you take this episode? Well, actually, before I get into that, I just want to say, do you think that speaking of like potential or like hypothetical guests, do you think there is a chance we could get like the owner or trainer for Chauncey on the show <laughs> just to like see what would happen? Like, I don't even know if they watch Mad Men. Like, it would be like, you know, just a chance for them to like find out about this weird ongoing. Do we find thing out it's had. like it's Ben Crew or something? Like, oh, wow. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a twist worthy of uh, u- unusual suspects or something. Or sorry, usual suspects. We got to do something kind of kind of different, right? We kind of have to set ourselves apart a little bit. So sure. I, I like that thinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, sorry. The question was, uh, what did I think about this episode outside of the South stuff? Yeah. Did you, did you love it? Did you like it? Did you, you know, what were your, what were your emotions? I, well, it's interesting because like this is an episode where everybody is just kind of disappointed with each other. Like Connie eventually is disappointed with Dawn. Betty is disappointed with Dawn. Uh, you know, um, Pete just is completely unsatisfied. General uh, Sal is disappointed by Dawn. Uh, you know, Sally is also, or not Sally, um, Betty is disappointed with Henry, at least for a little bit. And I don't know, it's like all these people are disgruntled with each other. And I find it sadly kind of fitting that I found this episode to be a little disappointing. Not in the sense that it's bad. I mean, I don't think there's been that I've seen a bad episode of Mad Men, but I think this one's a little bit weaker and clunkier than the other ones, especially when it comes to the writing and historical aspects. I think usually the show is better about incorporating its place and time and uh, where the characters fit in or out of it. And I think especially when it comes to uh, Martha Luther King and then the unfortunate bombing of those four girls in Birmingham, I feel like the show is really kind of awkward about it. And I feel like it never really organically fit into the show in the way that I think the show is usually better about. I totally disagree. Okay. I actually think this is one of the better ways they integrate it because I feel like that awkwardness is working in the show's favor to me. I think the reason I it works for me as much as it does is because when it gets brought up, you really see how it's just sort of happening in the background of these characters' lives. And that feels really genuine and realistic to me of like when things kind of happen, like 
things things happen today to us in 2023, the last two years, a lot of the time when like big major events happen that are going to be remembered for a long time, it's it's not the focus of our day. It's just sort of something that's like pops up on the radio and then a character might kind of try to like bring it up or talk about it. And it feels a little bit awkward because people don't want to talk about it because they don't know how they feel about it yet. Um, I, but yeah, I mean, it's clearly not for you. I mean, I would agree if the show was, I think, more subtle about it, but I think it the fact that it always has to kind of highlight it and like awkwardly put it into the dial, it just never felt really organic to me in a way that I feel like the show is typically better about or even smarter about. Mike, are you are you team John or team Will? Are you, are you team equality or are you team... <laughs> I, can I be honest? I feel like I'm right in the middle because... Oh God, I hate it when people say that. It's just like, I, I think I'm in the I'm, middle I'm, between you two. Yeah, yeah. So sorry, John. I, you know, not everybody has Take to agree with you. You know, most of the time, I don't think you hear no. You know, maybe it's because <laughs> right, people right. are scared. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, because I did think... When the I Have a Dream speech came on the radio, I did get this like feeling of like, I just, it, it was. To be clear, not because of anything negative. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, yes, to be clear. Of how it was inserted into the show. But I also think it's just such a well known, iconic speech that there's no way that they reveal that information or put it into the show without it feeling like, you know. Not to bring up other stuff, but like even in Oppenheimer, right? When they bring up JFK voting, like it just kind of felt like that kind of moment to me where it's like, yep, that makes sense. That is factual. Like this is how it would happen. But it's just like so known or maybe even expected. But what I did enjoy, I I really love the scene with with the radio and Carla. And then that interaction, because there's already tension between them. So injecting that into that scene with with Carla and the radio was really great. Did that Um, work better for you, Will? Or do you have the same kind of... No, I I was going to say, I think that's probably the best example, especially considering that it just shows how completely oblivious Betty is, even though she is a little bit more progressive minded than maybe your typical housewife at this time. I mean, you know, she's still just completely, you know, aloof. And, you know, even though she spends like however much time with Carla, she just is totally unaware of uh, um, the plight of black Americans. And yeah, I mean, I think that's probably where it's at its best. And I kind of wish it was more, you know, it was more like that and less like what Mike's saying, where it's like having sort of like an awkwardly leaden conversation in the car with Don and uh, Suzanne. But but I think I, mean, I, I liked I, I like the thing I liked about that was the sort of out of place like the speech isn't happening in real time. It, it's being referenced or talked about the next day. And I think that that's what I, I like that the show doesn't like stop and have like all the characters in the office, for example, be like, whoa, there's this speech going on. You know what I mean? And I think I think that's why it probably works sure. a little bit better. It could have been worse. I'm, I agree. But I still don't, I don't know. Maybe it's like Mike saying, like, maybe there's no like natural way to integrate into plot. And I understand that. But. I don't know. It just it still just didn't feel natural to me. It, it definitely felt very written, which is fine. I mean, the show is very literary in its approach, but I don't know. I just think Mad Men's been better about that. There's also that scene, too, right, where like they're at the fundraiser and you have like the Republican liberal, you know, women who are just sure. like, you know, laughing and, you know, self-satisfied with themselves about being against segregation and all that stuff. It's like, it's 1963, not 1863. True. Uh, and then like Carla literally enters the frame in between them. And it's just like the visual humor yeah. of that. It's like, it's not subtle at all, but obviously no. like it, it hits. I mean, at least that one, like directorially, it's a little bit more interesting. And yeah, like the fact that she's like in the frame for the whole conversation, you know, it's very purposeful and, and, you know, not understated, but, I don't know. Like I said, I don't think Mad Men is like the worst offender of this sort of thing, even, you know, when I think it's a little bit weaker. It's not like American Sniper when, um, you know, like Bradley Maybe. Cooper is looking at the TV and 9 11's happening. Oh, and he's just like, yeah. how could this have happened? And then the next scene is him and like, you know, fighting in, in the war and stuff and the Iraq war. And it's just like, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's, it definitely has been worse elsewhere. I just think, you know, Considering how well the show's done in the past, I think this is this leaves a little bit to be desired. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of this episode. I I really really like it. Um, it's just hard to watch for you know a couple of very specific reasons. And this is also one of those episodes where like you know it ends with Don finally getting some sleep first of all, but also 
you know, getting back into an affair. And it's just, I keep, I keep running into this thing where I feel like this, this show just like warps your morality. At least it does mine <laughs> where, because like he does these objectively terrible things, but like, because you're so invested and hooked onto the character of Don Draper, you're just like, Hmm, you know, uh, Oh, he's having an affair. That's going to be good for the, for business. And, mm-hmm. you're, and then you have to like pause and look at yourself and be like, what am I saying? <laughs> no, I, I definitely agree with that. I think the Suzanne stuff in this episode is probably the strongest. Um, just because like you said, like I had similar thought where I'm just like, you know, an affair would be really good for Don right now. It'd help his business <laughs> and the creativity and, <laughs> You know, well, Mike, like, I know you're yeah. the one on the podcast who doesn't like affairs. Uh, but so, like, what, what, what did you land? Was that uh, sickening uh, to you, your stomach? No, I, that's the thing, too. I'm with you. I, but I had an all-time quote from Hannah, who was reading a book while I was watching this episode. And, you know, the episode wraps up. He hooks up with Suzanne. And Hannah turns to me and she goes, why do you watch this show? They're all hosts. Wow. That would be for, funny. For for, what? for all hosts? They're I was laughing. All, they're all hoes. They're all hoes. I was. I, was the, I, was I thought muted, the punchline was going to be that, like, yeah. the book she was reading was like a book about, a, like, where the characters do affairs. She was people. reading a speech. Uh, it was called oh. "I Have a Dream," <laughs> <laughs> which is funny because that's not even the speech that's like being said here, right? It's uh, diff- or is it that speech? I thought it was the a different, like the the, the speech is in gave. the car, and then when Carlos listening to the radio, oh, okay, it's okay, the, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. the funeral of yeah. the girls, yeah. But it was, I, I will say, it was just such a good clarifying moment for someone who just jumps in and watches random episodes with me to watch it all and just be like, they're all terrible people. It's true, though. I mean, it's... Except you know, for poor Sal. He's, well, you know, a good guy. He lies to his wife at the end. True. Well, sure, yeah, and, and who knows? And then has his to. own affair. Sure. Yeah, so I was going to bring this up in trivia, but uh, they cut a scene where Sal go. There's, there's a guy in the background. Um, I'll go ahead and do a little bit of a an early trivia note here. Um, so that park that they're at is called the Ramble in New York City, and uh, it's a section of Central Park where, for a long time, uh, you know, and this time in particular, it was like pretty well known. Like gay men would go there to meet for sex, right? I think there's a, this is mentioned in Angels in America, the 2003 film, and the one of those guys in the background is uh, a key grip for the show. And I was listening to the commentary, and Brian Bat mentioned it's like, oh yeah, there's a there's a moment where I lean in to go kiss that guy, but they cut it for some reason, mm. I guess, to make it more. Uh, you know, ambiguous, right? Sure. I like that you called Angels in America the 1993 like film, like HBO. But no, but not even like the Pulitzer Prize winning play. It's like a mini series, <laughs> right? I, I guess, know, but like, seen... the play is like way more famous than the adaptation. I, I've never seen it, so you know, okay. you can. Well, sorry. I haven't seen Damn. it either, but you know, like the play is what's like renowned. I think. Right? I mean, I'm sure the movie's fine, but this is right. the most passion I've ever heard. Will God I know, damn. I didn't know he was such a, an Angels in America scold, but that's mm. okay. I mean, we all, all right. have our thing. <laughs> So, yeah, if we didn't make it clear enough, this is our last episode with Salvatore Romano. And that's the last we ever see of him. We don't really know what happens next or his character. I know Brian Batt has talked about this uh, over the years. You know, uh, he had this Esquire interview in 2015 about it where he, he really doesn't know, like, you know, but why? You know, there wasn't any closure on the Sal character. You know, I'll say characters come and go in the show, right? A lot of characters just kind of vanish. And I think Weiner and Co., a lot of their thinking, I think, around this has been like, that's real life. Like, you just, the people you knew for a while just kind of disappear from your life and you don't see them again and sometimes characters come back in the show but most of the time they don't and for sal though well i don't know are you are you feeling a little bit like how am i supposed to go on with this show now that they've lost the heart and soul for you yeah i think you guys are lying i think sal's gonna come back he's gonna be better than ever pretty soon Uh, he's gonna be you know (laughs) we broke out all the goddamn stops bro (laughs) We, we're just trying to make this easier. Um, yeah, you are in a stage of grief. Isn't de- not denial? Right, right. He's, yeah. He's maybe by the end of this episode, he'll be in bargaining. He's like, we'll, 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 we'll get Sal, you know, and Chauncey in the end of the, the yeah, spinoff. Yeah. You we'll know, get he the joins spinoff. Chauncey's we'll write the pilot. <laughs> There was the anger with Angels in America. We went through that stage. Yeah, <laughs> anger, yeah. <laughs> um, but Mike, uh, you didn't really get a chance to to talk more about your thoughts on the episode, right? Yeah, you know, overall, it, this this episode is not exactly bloated, but it does feel like there's more pieces than usual, um, which I think makes it busy is the right word. This is a very busy episode, um, which I think unfortunately maybe doesn't allow each of its what could have been smaller pieces to be better 
it does have like little moments I love. Like uh, only Mad Men could have a character go from raping someone to being like the absolute funniest part of this episode. I will to this day, like it's one of my favorite Mad Men moments is is Pete Campbell smoking a cigarette. <laughs> and then just <laughs> hacking up along and then standing in front of I mean, a fan. Yeah. It's so funny. I think it should have been like a continuing joke throughout the episode. Like in the background of the office, you just hear like some <laughs> coughing going on. Pizza like coffee. Yeah. <laughs> like while Harry and Paul are eating. Trudy, I, I know I've already been to the doctor twice, but can you just make another appointment? <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> uh i was gonna ask too because we we see a little bit of that commercial we have the hilton pitch there's plenty of advertising in this episode uh what do you think of the hilton pitch because i i generally think that is a legitimately good campaign and i i you know it, it, a lot of people might watch this and be a little bit like well what's conrad's problem right yeah i mean i thought it was, it was really solid um I, I I definitely knew there was going to be something going on with Conrad, um, especially the first time I watched. It. I thought he was going to be more mad at like the unAmericanness of it. I guess of like all these different places and words and how do you say these things that you know because he just fucking hates commies and anything outside of America so much. But then he had a completely different complaint. It surprised me and Don. I think that's, maybe that's why I like this episode more than you all because the the father son stuff between him and Don in this like really really strike me. Uh, lucky strike me just just the way that like he he has everybody leave the room and you know you've been setting up the whole episode that you know he tells don like i see you as a son calling up in the middle of the night uh you know that dynamic of like don kind of you know opens up to him a little bit it's like man that means a lot to me you know like you can tell don is sort of like you know don himself has so many daddy issues right and so in that moment when don tries to make him proud you know reminds me of the high ally episode we just you know we just put out by the time people hear this and you know the the father-son dynamic there kind of is seeding this moment where Don is just like, this is good. This is good. Like, he's like kind of desperate. And like, Connie's just like, what do you want from me? Love. And you could just tell that he's like, that this is really a moment of like, I'm not proud of you. You know, yeah, like, I wanted you to give me the moon. I wanted you, I wanted you to give me something completely unreasonable. And is that the kind of thing that fathers like Conrad Hilton put on their children? Right. And yeah, I, I, I felt that. Um, you know, even though I have not, I have absolutely not that relationship with my father, to be clear. <laughs> my father has never uh, treated me that way. Uh, and, and I don't want you two to, you know, you guys don't have to get into your daddy, is- your father issues, whatever you want to say. But yeah, the Conrad stuff. Will Ashton. True. Uh, this is uh, Chelsea Ross plays the character. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I feel like you, you're, you're, you're a fan, right? Like you've been, you've been, how's the Hilton storyline been shaping up for you so far? I've been enjoying it. I mean, I think primarily it's just the like the outsized performance of it that I've really enjoyed. Just the the way that uh, he really like makes a meal out of each line and each uh, little moment that he has on screen. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you know, he he Don kind of broke the big rule, which is that he didn't really listen to the client. And you know, it's as absurd as you know his interests were in the proposal. He didn't really incorporate them as he saw fit. And yeah, I mean, it's a solid pitch. I mean, I. I don't think it's maybe as great as Don is suggesting, but yeah, it's it is a good you know good ad campaign, and it probably would do well, but it wasn't what the client wanted, and you know I think he just uh, was off his game, and I guess you know sleeping with Suzanne uh, will will probably fix that, but you know he's, he's off in it. over his head, sure. as Roger said. I will say Suzanne at least thus far is one of my favorite Gumars of the show. Uh, I think she's a really interesting <laughs> character. I don't know how you feel about that. What, what do you What do you like about her? I mean, I like that she like uh, pushes back on Don and like is you know she's smart, she's independent, she's self reliant. She, she doesn't let him get away with anything. Yeah, it doesn't let him well, get away except, with stuff. You know, having sex with her. Sure, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think she's you know you know out, clearly outspoken and like knows what she wants, but you know is willing to kind of protect her own. But you know, also very romantic and yeah, she wants to and flirt, poetic yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. What do you think, Mike? You like you like Suzanne? Oh, Suzanne. I think it's Spencer, I right? I think I think I think it's definitely an interesting foil like affair for Don. Because now there's been so many affairs that you can compare affairs, which is very fun. And, and I do like what she says, you know, about it being different and he's not prepared for it of like yeah, yeah uh, you know, being so close and intertwined into his life already. It's not in his Manhattan life. But hey, look at Look what my name is for this podcast, Hot for Teachers. So let me tell you, <laughs> I get it. Um she only lives two miles away. 
Uh, sure. And you can kind of you can easily parallel Don and her in that room right at the end of the episode with Betty and Henry. The the episode actually opens with Betty kind of fantasizing about Henry and, you know, having that little bit of like a fantasy uh, in the commentaries. You know, well, first of all, I forgot to mention this earlier, but uh, there are two commentaries for this. I listened to um, the whole thing with Brian Bat, Chelsea Ross and John Hamm. And it was really fun. It, it, like the three of them it was one of the better commentaries I've listened to for the show because you could tell the three of them just like enjoy each other's company sometimes you listen to these and they're like really searching for something to say but this was not one of those moments they're just like very natural but uh the other commentary is uh, matthew weiner and scott hornbacher and uh you know they were they were talking about this a lot in it and uh i i, I think it was uh weiner who kind of mentioned how like this episode is so victorian you know continuing that thing with like the fainting couch and like betty is like writing this kind of like fantasy of like what she wants with henry right and uh weiner also mentions that this to, this episode to him is about impulse, you know, and it's about like wanting something now and not thinking about how that's going to affect somebody mm-hmm. else. Right. And uh, so like, obviously, like Betty wants this thing with Henry. She doesn't, she's not really thinking about like how it's going to affect anyone. Right. And, you know, it's it's all throughout the episode, like even the, the moment where Sally like wants that pencil box, you know, and it, it, they're using that moment to kind of show how like childish it really is like ed- fundamentally. But, you know, it's something that we all just experience of like people just want things, you know, Conrad wants the moon. He wants to call Don whenever he wants. Yeah, and and yeah, I, that's why Betty says at the beginning of the episode, you know, I want what I want when I want it, you know. So huh, I, I think I think that that's uh, something that you can really tie. Like busy episode, sure, but I think you can find that in every little little nugget. Like Lee Garner, you know, like wants wants Sal, you know, sees him as an object. And he doesn't care that like this is Sal's job and like it's horrendous what he's doing. Yeah. So then, what are you saying applying this theme to the civil rights movement, John? <laughs> Yeah, because like Betty even makes that thing. It's just like maybe maybe it's too early for like. Yeah, and you know what that tells me too, where she's a little bit like, uh, you know, for her, she kind of like doesn't have that self awareness of like she's going to lecture somebody else about wanting something. And I don't think the episode's impugning the idea of wanting something because you know it's just sort of like impugning like I think people who you know want something but then don't really like put thought into who it affects. Whereas like she doesn't understand like this is something like that needs to happen because it's affecting people negatively already. That's how I take it. Yeah, no, I'm definitely glad that you uh, described the Henry Betta relationship as sort of Victorian uh, because, yeah, I was thinking about that, like just how like sort of it's like pretty chast, at least in this episode of being like without like of to give me a kiss upon my cheek. It's like, <laughs> not now. I cannot lay it upon where you squander. Well, and that's then, why Betty reacts the way she does when he like tries to like put the full on move. Right. right. Where she's because that's not the fantasy she has in her head. Right. And then, yeah, even having a literal fantasy at the top of the episode. Um, And then, yeah, Dawn on the other end is just like, fuck me. Like, I don't think <laughs> fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> let me in <laughs> yeah let me in. more ways than one right yeah but no uh it, it also like the fundraiser like she had something in her head about the fundraiser and when she didn't get it she like lashed out violently and you know it i, I just think she it's funny fit. she like it's we're getting we're going right back to just betty being a four-year-old in this episode it's it's progressing wild. yeah yeah Absolutely. Okay, I was going to ask about this too. So, uh, so there's the moment where Lee Garner uh, calls Harry drunk and asks him to or tells him to get rid of Sal. So there's a lot of debate around Harry Crane's actions here. Uh, first of all, are you starting to see it? Will how terrible Harry Crane is? <laughs> how he's the worst? I mean, he certainly but- seems more of like a you know a dweeb. Uh, for sure. And, you know, I mean, on the one hand, (laughs) but on the one hand, like Lee was a little confusing about it. It's like, fire this guy, but don't tell anybody. And, you know, Harry's just kind of like, I don't don't know what that means, you know, but I do think he should have, you know, told someone other than Paul, like, you know, at least, you know, reported to Don so that he could maybe like smooth the waters a little bit with Lee, you know, privately and then protect. No, he should have told Don. Okay. I feel like this is obvious and, and will not to, to cut you in any place. Like Matthew Weiner, agrees with you a little bit i think um but uh matthew weiner said like i actually believe other than telling paul about it harry has done the right thing um he says hoping he's he, like hoping it'll go away and even if it doesn't like it won't really affect him blah blah, blah. I, I don't think weiner is right but i i just feel like how do you not tell roger like the the line about like that's a 25 million dollar account you stuck your nose in. like harry's lucky yeah. he has his job like it, all you have to do is be like this is what happened mm-hmm. and he told me not to say anything and like you have to let the account people handle it i 
I understand and connect with Roger's frustration in this episode because Roger is just like you you all just like don't you know really understand and respect like what the accounts people are here to do and this stuff is blowing up in your face for a reason true I mean I think Roger would have just fired Sal on the spot and I think that would have just I don't know I don't know if it would have made it better but it definitely would have just hurt Sal I think if he had gone the dawn Don would have been a little bit more pragmatic about it I mean I don't know like I mean considering the sort of uh trouble relationship that Don and Roger have at this point I don't know if it would have ended up much better but see yeah. see I don't think Sal would have been fired if if I think he would have been taken off the account Yes. And maybe that would hurt his career. Exactly. But he wouldn't have been fired. The reason he's fired is because it was such a public storm out. And also, even if he was fired, which it, it, there is a chance, right, that they would do it anyway just to be safe because it's too important, right? Like they don't want you know Sal to be seen. Even if they do that, you have a chance to work something out with Sal. Like it doesn't blindside him like that. Right. You know what I mean? Mitigate the damage, you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. Just like out of nowhere. And like the way that Harry just like makes an executive decision to do nothing, I think is worse than like, you yeah, because I feel, I feel like style getting fired is inevitable from the, the standpoint of the writers. And, you know, sure. yeah, no matter how you look at it, I, I think that's why I think that's, that's why Weiner is just like, oh, I would have done what Harry did. But, you know, just don't sure. do anything because it's inevitable. It's going to happen well, anyway. I mean, I definitely think it's dumb that he did like nothing because like obviously it wasn't just like yeah. a random thing that he just called. Uh, even though he was drunk and all that. But yeah, I mean, assuming it was just going to blow over is, uh, you know, just incredibly <laughs> dumb. But yeah, but that's the worst part of Harry. You know, it's like, you know, at least, you know, Pete Campbell is spineless, but at least he's good at his job. Harry's spineless, bad at his job, and also egotistical. Yeah. It's, it's just the worst. He's like bad in every way. But I know if Will, he's your he's your problematic fave. We have to respect I that. I would not go that far. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I, I don't even really like him all that much, but like, I just don't, I don't know. I guess at this point, I don't like hate, hate him. Like, I don't like, I don't, I don't feel as strongly as negatively about him as I do for someone like Pete, but I'm sure that'll change because you guys have watched the whole dang show already. <laughs> it's, uh, it's tough watching this episode. Like, Brian Bat has so many good moments, you know, when he throws the, f- the film reel and just his body language in that room, like where he has his arms around, he's like covering, you know, himself, right? And like, He's just, you can tell in that moment, Brian Bad even said this in the commentary. He's like, he's not attracted to Lee Gardner Jr. in the slightest. And you, know, you can feel the hurt when like Don basically implies that like he's some kind of deviant or something like that. You know what I mean? It's like nothing happened. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's just like, it's awful. And you can right. watch the show and you can see Don be like, you know, in the commentaries too, I think it was, I think, I, uh, who said it? I think John Hamm said this. Uh, I, uh, someone's going to have to keep me honest on that. It's either John Hamm or... <clears throat> Brian Bad himself, I think it was him saying that like, I, I don't think it's not that Don is like homophobic. It's not all this stuff. He's just like, you know, he has to do what he has to do. And like, and I'm listening to that. And I'm like, mm, you're recording this in like 2009, 2010. Right. No, I and mean, like, he you said know, you people. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, and they even referenced that, but it was just sort of like this weird, you know, I was like, yes, Don is homophobic. Are you joking? I mean, he may not be as homophobic as other people at the time, but similar like Betty, like, you know, she still is a sheltered housewife. Like she may be more progressive yeah. than other but she's still i mean you know inherently racist i think it's just like a product of like yeah this is like the post west wing sort of like this is like 2009 2010 obama's president and there's this idea of like being homophobic means that like you wouldn't shake sal's hand you wouldn't touch him it's just like no it's because they even mention it's like that it's not personal it's just business and the idea that you can't be out and gay in 1963 in advertising and it's like yeah that's homophobic you are afraid of gay people out living their lives because mm-hmm. you it hurts you know you're normal like that's what homophobia is and yeah it's just like such a product of its time i'm not trying to say anything you know i'm not going after no. john ham i'm sure like right. you know a lot of people have changed their positions on these sorts of things over the years and yeah right i mean i think there was some hope because of the beginning of the season um like they have that exchange on the plane and it suggested yeah. that like when don was saying uh you know like kind of like look out for your own he was like looking out for his best interest but now if you hear this you think like oh he was just like kind of keep like like your personal affairs at home and leave business to business and just like do what you can to excel in business, which, you know, is, which is just incredibly huge. huge. Yeah. And, and huge coming from Don. I mean, that's the whole thing too here with, you know, Don's mad that he got intertwined into business. Like eight of not nine of Don's affairs are with clients, you know, with Rachel Mankin <laughs> yeah, and Bobby with Barrett, yeah. exactly. Sally's teacher is probably going to be in a commercial next episode. Sure. <laughs> um, ex teacher. 
That's right. Uh, that's right. Yeah. So that's why and apparently it's Bobby's okay. teacher is Bobby's teacher is only just she's okay. Okay, Bobby, you little heartbreaker. What's going? They on? They mostly here? color. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, He's coloring some lewd uh, drawings. Maybe so. Um. But yeah, I mean, I do think if this is indeed the last uh, episode with Sal, I, I do think it just feels a little premature because, like, you know, at the beginning of the season, you know, it suggested that. Sal has never had sex with a man or even maybe even like done more than like kissing her second base with a man. And to like end it with him, you know, going to, you know, like this notorious uh, gay part of town and like having, you know, at least like a one night stand with a man that he doesn't really know and maybe going down a self-destructive path just seems a little rushed to me at this point. But I don't know. I mean, at the same time, he is at a pretty low, desperate point. And, you know, if if he lost his job because of his homosexuality, at least in part, then I can kind of understand that as well. But probably yeah, purposeful, just, too, that, uh, you know, we don't see Kurt and Schmitty in every episode. But, you know, the actual like out gay man, you know, is right. here, uh, you know, um, is, uh, you know, doing the that whole thing. And so, like, just putting it out. I wonder if that was I, I assume that that was intentional. Yeah, probably. It, it hurts too seeing uh, Sal in the art department with like the work, you know, like we see the pop mm-hmm. school account. We see the first ad uh, from the pilot that we see like him do with like his neighbor that says like relax. And it's just like, God, God damn it. Like, I personally believe they should have. I get I get it. I get the idea of like Sal just kind of goes off into the distance. You have to use your imagination. Man, I just I just wish they had done something else with Sal over the years. I remember, you know, when uh, I started watching the show week to week, people were talking about it all the time. You know, it's like, oh, season five, you know, is he going to pop in uh, as season six rolls around? It's like, hey, you know, what would be cool if, if, if Sal, you know, because because there were some characters where that would happen um, who would, you know, characters would come out of the show. I won't say who and then he'd come back for an episode or something. But yeah, never Sal. And it just it it's, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to swallow. I guess uh, maybe, you know, we have to just fill in the blanks. What happened to Sal after after uh, Sterling Cooper? Mike, uh, what's your fan fiction? I don't know if I like all these double entendres you're doing here, but... Which one? Which one did I just do? Never mind. Don't worry about it. Was it the swallowing? Yeah, hard to fill in. Uh, You know, I I, I, I get it, you know. Jesus. (laughs) I mean, I'm I'm big on the Chauncey Chauncey Sal spinoff show where they're, you know, doing their own thing in New York City. I think the tagline is... uh, uh, they take down the city doggy style. Yeah. Well, I was, I was imagining like the trailer. It's just like one is an absolute dog. The other is a golden retriever together. <laughs> they're going to tell New York whose Wait, business. Yeah. I'm sorry. Do New you York. think Chauncey is a golden retriever? Oh, what was he? I don't even remember what he is anymore. Uh, is Chauncey Airbud in your head? Yes. <laughs> also, of course, the, the name of this Disney Channel original movie is uh, Pitches and Bitches. Yeah, exactly. Damn. Yeah. The, New York is going to the dogs. <laughs> I actually do. Mike think he's imagining Chauncey as Airbud. <laughs> I really do. Too. It's like instead of basketball, Airbud is like hey. an advertising. Right. It's like it's, the it's like the shaggy DA where he has like the glasses and the suit. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it, it, Conrad, Conrad's really like, you didn't give me what I wanted. And then Chauncey's like, Woof! and he's yeah. like, that's what I wanted. He's a, you he's you a park Irish a hard setter. bargain. <laughs> you park a hard bargain. But I gotta say, I like your rough style. Well, I know you're 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 a fan of uh, Conrad Hilton's hat in this episode. Oh, I was yeah, I was so happy when it came in with that uh yeah that hat on i was just like that's how you that's a man who knows he's here to do business how do you I, why do you think he's wearing a hat because i think he I, I always get the sense that he's a little ashamed to be in new york like i think there's a part of him that sees himself as a more midwestern sort of guy and that he's in this like very metropolitan well, he's part of town what's well, so i mean yeah so i think like that's him just kind of like midwestern that's like sorry sorry i sorry i meant texas i uh, I, was, I was just like michigan what are you talking about no, no, no. I, I, what I mean though is like, I think his southern roots like prevent, like he doesn't want to be, you know, just the, you know, like another one of these suit and tie personalities. I think he wants to stay true to who he is. And I think by having the hat, he's just like, I ain't forgetting who I am. I'm keeping myself to who I am. Uh, that's, that's a good read. I, in the, the commentaries, they asked this, uh, Chelsea and John Hamm and, uh, John Hamm's kind of like, cause he can, because he like, nobody will tell him to take it off. Like it was very rude at the time to wear a hat. Right. In this context, like Don even, you know, tells those guys in the elevator, right. First season, I think it's like, you take your hat off. 
Um, but it's Conrad Hilton. He knows he can. And then Chelsea puts this thing out there I thought was interesting where he's like, I think he sees himself as like the good guy in a Western, right? Like he's the protagonist. And so like, it's a way of him just sort of being like, I'm the center of attention here. I, th- I thought that was kind of interesting, like a, an interesting read. I could see it being like a combination, right? Of like, you know, and I don't know, by the way, if it was like a real thing, like if he really did that, like wore that hat everywhere. I assume so, because they're pretty thorough on this. Uh, Maybe he, he just yeah. uh, went forward in time and saw No Country for Old Men. And was just like, I really like Woody Harrelson's character in this film. He has such a cool hat. What if I was just like that around the office? Also, like, uh, I didn't know there was like... I I didn't know Conrad Hill and the real person had such a like Bible thumping thing going on. I, I know we've talked about this a little bit already, but like, like how he wants to bring like America and Christianity and stuff, I guess. Cause like when I think of Hilton, I think of like very secular, very worldly. Cause you know, like Paris Hilton, you know, like, I, I don't know. I just, I just never think of like it as like this kind of evangelical kind of thing, which I guess it wasn't right. Cause this is the sixties, but uh, yeah, it, 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 the show I think does a good job of kind of giving you an impression of a person who I think, you know, he's so obsessed with his legacy, but I feel like, you know, there's even that joke of like Don doesn't even recognize him. And then I think most people wouldn't, you know, recognize Conrad Hilton today. And so he didn't really get what he wanted, but he did get what he wanted in a sense of like, yeah, there are Hilton's all over the world. And, you know, if you if you go to Athens, yeah, you could go. There was a funny bit of trivia, too, where uh, apparently the Athens Hilton is notorious for being extremely ugly and people hate it because it like messes up how Athens looks <laughs> because it's apparently at the time, I think. I don't know if it still does, but uh, they kind of imply it. Sure. Mike, you, you <laughs> nothing, nothing to say about Connie. You don't care about him. You're not your fave. I mean, again, no. I mean, I just see a Walt Disney impersonator. I, I do I do like the scene, you know, when he's just getting drunk. Because I think that's really what it is, the I see you as a son kind of stuff. It's just a lonely, drunk old man. And I do think, like, the through line that most of these men's most intimate moments together is drinking. Like, at the, at, at the uh, My Old Kentucky Home, um, now, now in this episode, and, you know... I, it also just kind of makes me think that's why he always has these ideas, right? Or is always changing things because he's, he's a drinker. And when people drink, they think they he's have these lonely. great ideas and they want to share the ideas. And then he's sober and he has to either change his idea because there's a bad idea or whatever it is, you know? I think, yeah, yeah, he's lonely, you know? And uh, you can tell, like, he, he's somebody who sees that he's getting older. Um, he has had to rebuild his fortune because he lost in the Great Depression, did it again, and he's running out of time. And I think that speaks his desperation where he wants Don to kind of deliver to him his dream. And it's completely unreasonable. It doesn't make any sense. But, uh, you know, I remember uh, John Hamm even said, it's like, I, he believes that if Don had just remembered the moon thing and done one last like thing for the, like in the pitch, like if the last card had referenced the moon at all, they would have, they would have nailed it. Probably, right. Yeah. And, uh, it, it, I think Chelsea even mentions, he's like, yeah, he's like kind of looking at it. He's like, he's waiting for the next one. Cause he thinks that's, that's what's next. And so you can almost speculate, like, is it because Con does Connie feel spurned because he feels like Don didn't really listen and could like deliver that legacy. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I if we, want to be more critical of connie he is a fairly manipulative personality and obviously he's like super self-centered and Mm -hmm. egomaniacal and stuff but he is i think you know a fairly down-the-earth guy who has like you know these visions of grandeur that uh yeah i mean i think you know at the end of the day a lot of it seems like a lot of it is just kind of pleasing the client and just even if they have these sort of wacky wild ideas just kind of finding a happy medium where you artfully sort of exercise it in a way that makes sense but also just kind of gives them what they want and it seemed like don for whatever reason was just kind of more focused on making the best pitch and just kind of working around what uh connie wanted and then you know kind of hoping that he'd forget whatever he, weird random things he said so in a way i guess that makes him kind of similar to harry in that respect yeah, where he's yeah. kind of like yeah maybe he'll just kind of forget the weird moon thing he said and and just go be happy with that guy it's like no you missed my point and you lose sir uh do you guys want to bring up anything else before we uh finish up with some trivia well i was gonna say uh, I know I'm not alone in feeling a little bit disappointed with this episode because I was reading from the Madman Carousel last night and Matt Dorsice was like really down on this episode and the last one. In a way, that was kind of like, whoa, like, hmm. I don't know. Like, he was just like, this is like. No, Murray and Keith Phillips weren't. Uh, Keith Phipps, uh, excuse me, who uh, reviewed this for uh, AB Club. Uh, I mean, they, I, just, they like I, said, a lot. I mean, I definitely agree with his complaints about this episode, but I don't know. Even I was just kind of like, I still think they're like, I definitely like Souvenir. And I thought this was still like overall a pretty good episode. I think it's weaker. It's probably the weakest of the season, but overall, I still enjoy it. But yeah, he was just like, 
this doesn't work and this doesn't work and what were they thinking with this? So I thought uh, that was pretty I'd, interesting. I'm with Noel Murray and Keith Phipps on this. I, I, I like this episode, but uh, I definitely wouldn't say it's the, but it would, not for me, the, the worst of the season. But uh, I know I know you two didn't like uh, Love Among the Ruins as much, right? Uh, earlier in the season. I feel like that which, has been kind of the lowest point for, for uh, our little group. And I, I thought that episode was good. Yeah, but, uh, which one? Is that the second one? The second episode, yeah. Yeah, um, I, mean, I still, I don't know. I Yeah, I would say like one of those two is probably, I don't know, I think I'd probably put Love among the ruins a little bit higher than this one but yeah i mean there's been like i said before no bad episode of mad men for me so far no i don't think correct. there is one personally i don't think there's a bad episode i mean there are just a few mediocre ones but yeah all right let's do trivia it's uh, everybody's favorite part um let's see here so we already kind of talked about this before it was kind of mentioned but uh when don is uh driving the car i mean we do have the i have a dream thing but we mentioned that uh but the radio also mentions the discovery of two of the bodies of two unnamed young manhattan women uh, so this is a reference to the career girls murder case um where these roommates uh janice wiley and emily hoffert were stabbed to death in their apartment on august 28th 1963 uh, so that's when this is taking place and uh, the i have a dream speech was being uh was the day before that right or no the, the the, the dream speech was August 28th, excuse me. So this is happening the day after. So uh, though there's something else uh, Conrad Hilton talks about. Khrushchev, he said the thing that made him fall apart was that he couldn't get into Disneyland. So this is a real thing that uh, apparently the, the leader of the Soviet Union, Khrushchev, he, uh, he made a trip to California in 1959. Um, to visit President uh, Eisenhower. And they uh, apparently he got into a fight with the anti-communist president of 20th Century Fox, uh, Spyro Skouros, and was barred from visiting Disneyland by government officials who were worried about the security. Uh, so yeah, real thing that happened. I, I had no idea um, that that was like a real thing. Uh, I just thought Conrad was sort of saying that to kind of, you know, be a little bit of a you know, anti-commie guy. Was Disneyland even that nice in 1959? Didn't it not get really good until like the 70s? It had its own charm back then, right? I mean, Walt Disney is alive. You know, he, you know, there, there are stories of how he'd be up like in the, the wee small hours still working on it you know, in the fifties and like, cause in my head with Disney world is really sick at that time. And Disneyland is just like this discount yeah. motel of a Disney park. world didn't exist yet. Is that true? Is it the other way around? D- Disney world did not exist until like after Walt Disney was gone. Oh, I'm thinking that the opposite direction. Somebody Anyways. didn't listen to our high and mansion episode of cinemaholics. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I haven't seen the movie yet. Why would I listen to the review? <laughs> Good save, good save. No, I wouldn't. I would be surprised if you had listened to that. I'd be like, wait, you really did? Why would you? Um, okay, so then uh, finishing up with some trivia here. Uh, Betty's letter, where she's writing the letter, that handwriting, and I believe the hand itself too, is uh, from the costume designer of the show. Uh, I forget her name, sorry. Um, uh, Chelsea brings up, uh, Chelsea Ross brings up that uh, a lot of the, like the foreboding in this episode is because like they are on the cusp of like the great divorce boom. Um, what divorce statistics really started to soar around this time that was particularly spurred by the jfk assassination brian bad even brings that up too he's like yeah that just really turned the whole decade upside down um i already mentioned the athens hilton being notoriously ugly oh yeah so uh, chelsea ross mentions that the actress who plays the woman uh at the fundraiser who shows up instead of henry so chelsea ross brings up he's like i worked with her once in 1975 so he like knew who she was he had worked with her one time and recognized her and so he he got like a little bit of a kick out of that because he you know they weren't in a scene together obviously and then brian bat brought up that the the march for the equality movement was happening around the time this episode aired so he thought that it was it was interesting how the the show at the time when it was coming out in 2009 2010 it was paralleling with uh you know the march for for gay rights and lesbian rights and uh, so brought that up. And uh, I know, Will, that probably makes you upset. And you're just like, what gay rights? Like, you have to be subtle about it. And uh, maybe it's maybe it's not. I'm just joking. All right. Fine. You know. <laughs> I think I already mentioned that uh, one of the guys in the background of the Ramble were sells at the phone roof with Nicholas Rini, uh, one of the key grips. And then uh, also Suzanne jogging. She mentions that she was jogging in episode seven. Um, so this is a payoff to that. And oh, yeah, this is the last thing. So apparently the, the actor who plays Lee Gardner Jr., they had to shoot all of his scenes. He had eight pages of, of uh, material in this episode, a lot more than he has before. And uh, they had to shoot everything in one day. So there are a couple of scenes where it's like it's half, they did half the scene only where he was in it. And then they had to do the rest later because uh, he works out in New York. So like they didn't have a lot of time. And that's it. Not a ton of trivia this year. There were we, what? I can't, what, what are we doing? I'm tired. Yeah, I mean, I do appreciate uh, that with as far as like Lee Gardner is concerned, like I, I think 
what's also heartbreaking is that it's not like Chow is like completely chast and like afraid. It's like he just genuinely doesn't find himself attracted to this guy. He's like he said he's like a bully. He's you know manipulative and you know kind of just wants to get his way. And I think that makes it even more heartbreaking that you know Sal had to be uh you know the 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 fall man for this whole thing yeah. for reasons outside of his oh, control. Oh, I missed really. something. Yeah. So I missed something. I, um, the whole thing where Conrad Hilton wants her to be a Hilton on the moon, that's a real thing. Like he really had specific plans and designs to do that. And if he doesn't want a space odyssey, you might remember there is a Hilton on the, the space station on its way to the moon. There you hmm. go. All right. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I'll say rest in peace, Sal. Uh, I, I, I do have a little bit of faith that you guys are lying that he's going to be back next week. Okay. I will say he is he is credited for the remainder of the season. You'll still see his name in the the credits of season three. But don't that's why hopes I'm up holding up hope. <sighs> uh, so it's not happening, man. <laughs> you know, I, I, I just mean, feel bad. I, well, let him let him have his fun, Mike. It's not our responsibility. He'll be back for the season finale. He'll be talking to Chauncey. It's all going to be great. It's all going to work out. <laughs> You sound like a lot of people on November 23rd, 1963. That's true. Right, that's right. true. Everything's going great. Yeah, Can't everything's, wait for everything's the, fine. It's a beautiful Can't day wait in for Texas. Roger's co- kid's wedding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Maybe we should take a trip to Dallas. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening to Mad Men, men. We'll be back next week. Talk about episode 10 of season three. What is it called? Let me look it up here. Episode 10, The Color Blue. I uh, love The Color Blue. It's a good one. Uh, we'll be there and uh, we'll talk to you then. It's a good Bye, color. Everybody. Yeah, good color. Yeah. <laughs>